Hello, lovelies. Well, today is a bit of a premature podcastulation. <laughs> I have been working on some more shwala for you, specifically about the anthropocosm, which seriously requires deep contemplation. And I came upon a line that perhaps I didn't understand. But I felt that to understand it better, I had to go to a person that I have heard rumors about. From people like Aaron Cheek and um, a girlfriend of mine, Debbie, who uh, really loves <laughs> what this person has to say. And this started a journey that was simply or inspiring, which is kind of why I'm doing a premature podcastulation. It was a journey, in fact, to the heart of the Western wisdom tradition. Well, perhaps more accurately, to the very beginning of it. And like most things, when you dig deep enough, it is not what we thought at all. You might be able to guess at this point who I turned to, but if not, it might be because you have not heard of him. I had not heard of him until recently. And what is worse, <laughs> I actually avoided him. And only because he wouldn't give me an interview. But quite frankly, I know now it was because I did not deserve it. I was not ready. And I'm probably still not, to be honest with you. I have watched a few of his videos and was terribly <laughs> unsatisfied because what he presented was a riddle. What I wanted was for him to tell me what to do. I wanted instruction, goddammit. And that was the key. I was entirely missing the point of his teaching. The point of his teaching, I think is that the answers are inside of us. And I think that's it, but I'm not sure. I think that he, like the great sages of old, point you towards the answer, but let you do the hard work and find out for yourself. So at this point... I'm really just guessing. Peter Kingsley, in his book, The Dark Places of Wisdom, reveals a kind of earth-shattering <laughs> revelation about our Western roots. And that is that the West is actually rooted in the mystical, not the rational he suggests that Plato buried this truth for his own ambition and negated the ancient Greek wisdom to arrive at its opposite, rationality. Now, I don't know enough about this to confirm or deny it, but it is certainly interesting to consider because it is indeed obvious that mysticism has been relegated to the fringes of our culture. In prose that is more an experience <laughs> than a read, Peter deliciously describes the Western dilemma. He says, and I quote him, and that's the purpose of this book, to awaken something we've forgotten something we've been made to forget by the passing of time and by those who've misunderstood or for reasons of their own have wanted us to forget. It could be said that this process of awakening is profoundly healing. It is. The only problem with saying this is that we've come to have such a superficial idea of healing for most of us, healing is what makes us comfortable and eases the pain. It's what softens, protects us. And yet what we want to be healed of is often what will heal us if we can stand the discomfort and the pain. 
We want healing from illness, but it's through illness that we grow and are healed of our complacency. We are afraid of loss, and yet it's through what we lose that we're able to find what nothing can take away from us. We run from sadness and depression, but if we really face our sadness, we find it speaks with the voice of our deepest longing. And if we face it a little longer, we find that it teaches us the way to attain what we long for. And what is it that we long for? That's what this story is about. He goes on a little bit further, and I'm just going to do it because it's so beautiful. (laughs) If you're lucky, at some point in your life, you'll come to a complete dead end. Or to put it another way, if you're lucky, you'll come to a crossroad and see that the path to the left leads to hell, that the path to the right leads to hell, that the road straight ahead leads to hell. And if you try to turn around, you'll end up in complete and utter hell. Every way leads to hell and there's no way out. Nothing left for you to do. Nothing can possibly satisfy you anymore. Then, if you're ready, you'll start to discover inside yourself what you always longed for but were never able to find. What he's talking about is mysticism, I think. It's a riddle, remember? (laughs) Or what mysticism is can teach you, right? What Peter is talking about could be considered heretical because we've been taught that the Western civilization was founded on logic and reason, delivered to us by Aristotle and Plato. But Peter feels that this belief has led us to where we are today. Only by facing the depths of human experience do we become fully human. By avoiding the dark, we come to fear it. It manifests as latent dissatisfaction, depression, and terror. Sadly, many of us will, as Peter says, come to the point of our death and find ourselves still wanting the thousand substitutes we aren't able to have. Because, he says, there's no knowledge left anymore of how to find access to what's beyond our waking consciousness. We have to take anesthetics and drugs. And because there's no longer any understanding of powers greater than ourselves, We're denied any meaning to our suffering. So we suffer as liabilities and die as statistics. Life has become an endless affair of trying to improve ourselves, achieving more and doing more, learning more, always needing to know more things. This process of learning and being taught has simply become a matter of being fed facts and information receiving what we didn't have before, always being given something different from ourselves. That's why whatever we learn never touches us deeply enough. Why we sense this the more we rush around trying to find substitutions for the void we feel inside. Everything pushes us outside ourselves, further away from the simplicity of our humanity. Where does the knowledge for growth lie? Inside ourselves. We already have everything we need. We just have to be shown what we have. Now, again, I have not finished the book, and I fear there won't be the instruction that I seek. (laughs) God damn, that addiction is hard to kick, huh? But so far, what he has been talking about in the book is incubation. He says that it's a bad word or not a great describer of what he's talking about. But 
Kingsley does go into great detail about where incubation came from and how he came to the idea that Parmenides, the teacher that is the hero of this book, the teacher of Plato, who Plato ultimately mistranslated, says Kingsley, or misunderstood, possibly, Parmenides utilized incubation as a means to mystically obtain his wisdom. And I think, I think, I think that's what Kingsley means. And I also think that this is the same method through which Kingsley accessed Parmenides in order to mystically obtain his understanding, I think. Again, I've not finished the book, and the book is dreamlike itself. So these are more impressions I am sharing with you, (laughs) as I might very well be wrong, okay? Anyway, dream incubation seemed like a central theme of this book. And so I ran off and Googled dream incubation, and I found another man. His name is Robert Bosnack who was equally as frustrating, I must say, (laughs) because he refuses to speculate on his findings about the nature of the psyche and kind of utterly refutes Jung, who I admit I've cleaved to, especially his ideas on archetype. I've found them useful. He describes his approach as one of being radically agnostic, insofar as, unlike Freud and Jung, he holds no particular position regarding the nature or the structure of the psyche, he expresses more interest in the lived experience of the dream than of its interpretation, rather than the use of any archetypes that a Jungian might be looking for. And it's very interesting I still, again, don't know what he is doing, so I guess I'm going to have to read one of his books. But he took a woman through a dream analysis, and uh, he uses what he calls a flashback to get back into the dream. And he has the woman focus her consciousness on certain aspects of the dream and takes her into a lived experience of that dream, which is well, was quite revelatory for the woman undertaking the analysis. But again, what does it mean? I don't know. But maybe you can watch it and tell me. (laughs) Anyway, he made a stunning point about dreaming. The creative imagination in dreaming is the greatest form of creativity that we have. Think about it. In a dream... An entire world is being created that presents itself as real, that presents itself as physical, and you know that you are awake in it, and it presents itself in the blink of an eye. Now, in contrast, think about Avatar, the movie. That took about 10 years to make, and even to make it, He had to invent all kinds of new technology in order to create the vision. It took hundreds of millions of dollars to do it. And yet your brain and my brain does exactly the same thing in a fraction of a second. That's really mind-blowing. Robert says that a dream is an event in time and space where you suddenly find yourself. He says dreaming is a place. He says it's very difficult to prove to yourself that you are not dreaming when you are dreaming, that there are very few things you can do. And he goes on to describe experiments that lucid dreamers have taken to prove to themselves that it wasn't a dream. And his point is that it's actually very difficult to do. I'll post the video for you to watch it. But here is the point. 
If you grew up in Western culture and someone asked you to list the 10 most important events in your life, chances are you would not include a dream. I wouldn't, or I wouldn't have up until now. I've had some crazy dreams and now I want to go back and really go back into them. But anyway, again, it's because of our materialistic prison paradigm. And in that paradigm, it's only objective events that are deemed to be real, right? We tend to dismiss dreams as being mere subjective phenomena, figments of our imaginations, with little or no relevance for actual conduct of our lives. Now, again, as is the case with magic, The attitude towards dream in the West contrasts sharply with that of virtually all other human societies, which have been holding dreams as sacred and indispensable windows into an invisible realm of the cosmos. And when you think about it, this has been especially true of the world's great mystics, most of whose biographies are peppered with accounts of these dreams, significant dreams conveying various kinds of teachings, instructions, and advice. Even the Buddha had a series of five dreams foretelling that he would attain full enlightenment and become a renowned teacher. Socrates insisted that dreams guided him throughout his whole teaching career. He said, I maintain that I have been commanded by the God to do this through oracle and dreams and in every way in which some divine influence or other has ever commanded a man to do anything. Mariam Abdun, the wife of Sufi master Ibn Arabi, who, like, oh gosh, what's his name? Suara D, heavily influenced Henri Corban, that I talk about in season two when I talk about the imaginal realm, which is honestly one of my favorite episodes. And I do want to get into a whole section of the imaginal realm, which this actually might be the beginning of because it's such a fascinating subject. But anyway, the wife said, I have seen in my sleep someone who I have never seen in the flesh, but who appears to me in my moment of ecstasy. He asked me whether I was aspiring to the way, to which I replied that I was, but that I didn't know by what means to arrive of it. He then told me that I would come to it through five things, trust, certainty, patience, resolution, and veracity. How awesome is that? But also how enigmatic. Anyway, as I said, I've not finished this book. So I have no conclusions to share, only or at this point. But I will end on some more Kingsley that stabbed at my heart in a good way. What isn't there in front of our eyes is usually more real than what is. Always we want to learn from the outside, from absorbing other people's knowledge. It's safer that way. The trouble is that it's always other people's knowledge. We already have everything we need to know in the darkness inside ourselves. The longing is what turns us inside out until we find the sun and the moon and stars inside. That is very anthropocosmic. More soon, lovelies.
Thank you for listening, lovelies. And if you like this podcast and would like to support us, please go to MagicalEgypt.com. And I have made a special discount coupon just for you all. And the coupon code is LOVE. And that will get you $30 off any Magical Egypt purchase. Also, um, I've started a Patreon, so you can mosey on over there and uh, see if you want to contribute. But I appreciate you listening and I appreciate all your support. And more soon. Thank you.